It's Wednesday, August 31st, 2022. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, the official trailer for the slasher horror version of Winnie the Pooh just dropped, and I think I actually want to watch the whole movie now. Plus, the latest update on when Artemis 1 will actually be launching and what happened at the Scrubbed launch on Monday. And the World Bog Snorkeling Championships. Here's some cool stuff for your ride home. Winnie the Pooh is the latest beloved children's character to get a gritty reboot thanks to the upcoming indie horror film Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey. Now, you may remember my extensive piece on this at the end of last May when the first images dropped from the film and the internet lost its collective mind over photos of demonic live-action Pooh and Piglet stalking in the background of a woman in a hot tub and leaving messages written in blood on the window. Well, this morning, the official trailer dropped, and it is everything I thought it would be, but also more. As Michael Walsh put it for Nerdist, the new trailer is good. Even though we were all ready to appreciate the movie for how absolutely bonkers the plot is, basically Christopher Robin grows up and therefore abandons the residents of the Hundred Acre Wood, leaving them to fend for themselves and turn into hardened serial killers. It's taking everyone a tad bit by surprise how genuinely decent the movie looks. Written and directed by Reese Waterfield, who has also directed movies such as Demonic Christmas Tree and Fire Nado, he told Variety in the spring that movies with wacky concepts like this really call for a delicate balance between funny ridiculous and actually scary. Based on the trailer, he also managed to work in a good amount of legitimate pathos. Walsh at Nerdist situates Blood and Honey as the extreme foil to the 2017 Goodbye Christopher Robin, starring Ewan McGregor as a grown-up Christopher Robin reuniting with Winnie the Pooh, saying, quote, It might even be more grotesque than the opposite of McGregor's sweet film, because this Blood and Honey trailer goes hard. Jason Voorhees hard. End quote. Which is true. Like, if you're not a slasher person, maybe don't even watch the trailer. There is a lot of blood and a couple gory shots that actually took me a bit by surprise. But Walsh continues with an important takeaway. Quote, There's a lot of blood, a little honey, and some genuinely creepy masks. But while this Winnie the Pooh blood and honey horror movie trailer is equal parts funny, how can it not be, and scary, there's an underlying idea here that could make this movie so much better than just a gimmick. Blood and honey could explore the dangers of revisiting the things we loved as kids, and holding on to an idea of what they should be, rather than dealing with what they are. Yeah, I really did just make the case the Winnie the Pooh horror movie might have something meaningful to say about the pitfalls of modern fandom and nostalgia. Entering the public domain really does lead to some weird stuff. End quote. And yes, public domain, that is how this indie production company is getting away with releasing a slasher film about a beloved preschool favorite. I went into the situation at length back in May, link in the show notes, but basically the first Winnie the Pooh book written by A.A. Milne entered the public domain at the start of this year. Subsequent books by Milne, including the second one, which introduces Tigger as a character, are not yet in the public domain. So, there will be no sadistic what I can only imagine would be some kind of Joker-esque Tigger in Blood and Honey. But keep your fingers crossed for a sequel. The Disney version of Winnie the Pooh, which, let's be honest, is the one most of us are more familiar with, even if you didn't watch it, those are the depictions that are splattered all over baby products and countless other consumer items, that one is not yet in the public domain, and if Disney has their way, it probably never will be. And the main difference between the A.A. Milne Winnie the Pooh and the Disney one is the Milne versions look a little more realistic, and Pooh himself doesn't wear clothes. There's no red shirt. Pooh does wear clothes in Blood and Honey, as does Piglet, but that's because they're more anthropomorphic. They basically look like full-grown men in ordinary clothes and rubber masks. Waterfield will probably still be safe from the wrath of the mouse, he told Variety in the spring, quote, When you see the cover for this, you see the trailers and the stills and all that, there is no way anyone is going to think this is a child's version of it, 
end quote. But we'll see how it plays out legally. And again, if you want more on the exact details of U.S. copyright law and how it applies here, give a listen to the May 26th episode. And if you genuinely want to see Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, all we know for now is that it will be on DVD and streaming on demand soon. My guess is that the production company Jagged Edge Productions is still negotiating some kind of better distribution deal than they usually get on the basis of the extra virality of this particular film, so they may be holding out on announcing an exact date just in case one of those deals goes through. And also, a final reminder that this is an indie film from a production company that brought the world movies like The Curse of Humpty Dumpty and Easter Bunny Massacre. They don't take themselves too seriously, and they work on an indie budget. So when I say the trailer looks better than I expected, that's because my bar was kind of low. And not exactly in a bad way, just a you-need-to-know-what-you're-in-for kind of way. Indie horror comedy is not everyone's genre. Maybe this trailer is more than you ever need to see. Or maybe this will become you and your friend's favorite movie to watch on Halloween. Either way, I will for sure update you as soon as we have an official release date and report back after I've seen it, because personally, I can't wait. And also, just as a little bonus on the note of indie genre comedies, there's a poster going around Twitter right now for the 2009 movie None of That, spelled N-U-N. It features a bunch of nuns holding glocks and the best tagline ever written, A blast for you and a blast for me. It works a little bit better when you see it written, but anyways, I immediately went to go look up the trailer for none of that, and wow, kind of feels like a low-budget Austin Powers, but with nuns. Link in the show notes if you want to watch that trailer. It's a decent chaser after the gory Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey trailer. Following the scrubbed launch on Monday, NASA has just announced when it will make its next attempt to get the Orion spacecraft and SLS rocket off the ground, and it's not either of their previously stated alternate launch windows. The alternate launch windows had previously been publicized as this coming Friday the 2nd and Monday the 5th, but in a media briefing last night, NASA officials announced they will be shooting for Saturday the 3rd. The two-hour launch window will open at 2.17 p.m. Eastern Time. Here's the official word from the NASA Artemis blog. Quote, Mission managers met Tuesday to discuss data and develop a forward plan to address issues that arose during an August 29th launch attempt for the flight test. During that launch attempt, teams were not able to chill down the four RS-25 engines to approximately minus 420 degrees Fahrenheit, with engine 3 showing higher temperatures than the other engines. Teams also saw a hydrogen leak on a component of the tail service mast umbilical quick disconnect called the purge can, and managed the leak by manually adjusting propellant flow rates. In the coming days, teams will modify and practice propellant loading procedures to follow a procedure similar to what was successfully performed during the Green Run at NASA's Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. The updated procedures would perform the chill-down test of the engines, also called the Quick Start Bleed Test, about 30 to 45 minutes earlier in the countdown during the liquid hydrogen fast-fill liquid phase for the core stage. End quote. Now, if you remember, one of the additional issues on Monday were multiple weather hazards that cut into the time the team had to prepare. They had to fill the tanks a lot faster than they would have liked, and it's thought that this is one reason that all of the engines, not just number three, weren't cooling down as much as they would like. This wasn't an issue at the Green Run in Stennis when they had ample time to fill, so that's why they referenced going back to the procedures they used successfully then. Their hope is, with giving themselves more time on Saturday, this won't be an issue. And as far as cooling down Engine 3 goes, science communicator and host of PBS's Far Out Swapna Krishna explained in a video on Twitter that NASA thinks this might be a sensor issue, not an actual engine cooling issue. This is because the liquid hydrogen being used to cool the engines so that they can ignite was actually accurate, even though the temperature read for Engine 3 was not. And even when they tried closing off the valves to the other engines and put all the liquid hydrogen to Engine 3, it still wasn't cooling down according to the sensor. 
As John Honeycutt, program manager for the development of the SLS rocket, said in the media briefing, quote, The way the sensor is behaving doesn't line up with the physics of the situation, and so we'll be looking at all other data that we have to use it to make an informed decision whether or not we've got the engine, all the engines chilled down or not. End quote. Now, this could be good news because it means the engine is actually getting cool. It's just a sensor issue, which still needs to be fixed, but seems like it would be an easier fix than a whole engine problem. Now, that's not confirmed yet, and as Krishna says, we don't know exactly what data they're looking for there. The team is trying to avoid just switching out the sensor because that would require rolling the rocket back to the vehicle assembly building, which, as I've mentioned before, is a huge, long, arduous, and expensive process that takes about a day in and of itself and could set full operations back weeks, and is therefore something the team continues to say isn't necessary when pressed by the media. Though, as the New York Times points out, quote, if NASA cannot launch by early next week, it will have to roll the rocket back to the vehicle assembly building. The flight termination system, explosives that can destroy the rocket if it goes off course, needs to be retested 25 days after being installed, and that can only be done in the vehicle assembly building. End quote. Senior communications specialist Rachel Kraft also noted on the official Artemis blog, as mission officials also did during last night's press conference, that the teams will reconvene on Thursday the 1st to review data and readiness. So we may get an additional update about that sensor issue and confirmation on whether we're a go for launch then. Now that said, even if we're a go for launch on Saturday, the weather doesn't look great. Mike Berger, a launch weather officer with U.S. Space Force's 45th Weather Squadron, said there is a 60% chance of a weather violation at Cape Canaveral during the launch window, but he is optimistic that the rain will be sporadic enough to clear at some point during the two-hour launch window, which again begins at 2.17 p.m. Eastern Time on this Saturday the 3rd. I'm not sure how much pomp and circumstance will accompany this launch attempt. The plan on Monday had been multiple celebrity appearances and performances by the likes of Yo-Yo Ma and the Philadelphia Orchestra. Especially since Saturday wasn't one of the original backup dates, I can't imagine everyone who was originally booked will still be available, unless some of those hyped appearances were pre-recorded virtual clips that'll play during the live stream, which is kind of significantly less exciting for both us, the audience, and the performers. In any case, keep your eyes peeled for another possible update tomorrow evening once the teams reconvene, and until you hear anything else, mark your calendars for a possible Saturday afternoon launch of the first mission on our return to the moon. Remember earlier this month when I talked about bog butter? It's butter that early Europeans, especially in Ireland, used to put into bogs to keep cool. And every now and then, residents and workers in bogs accidentally dig it up, still edible hundreds of years later. Well, at least over in Wales, they're keeping bog traditions alive with their Bog Snorkeling Championships, the 35th annual meeting of which took place on Sunday. Held in Lanarkid Wells, the smallest town in the United Kingdom with a population of about 850, the World Bog Snorkeling Championships is just one of several unusual sporting events held annually by the tiny town. Others include the World Mountain Bike Chariot Racing Championship, Welsh Open Stone Skimming, Man vs. Horse Marathon, and the Real Ale Wobble. As explained in a 2017 feature by Great Big Story, Lanarkid Wells used to be the center of pony trekking in Britain, basically a form of cross-country horseback riding. But as that pastime and industry began to sharply decline in the 70s, the town had to look for new ways to boost the economy, and eventually settled on hosting unusual events. Harkening back to their pony trekking days, many of the events include horses or bicycles, and they do successfully attract both athletes and spectators from around the world. The Bog Snorkeling Championships is one of their most headline-grabbing events, particularly due to the creative costumes that many competitors are encouraged to don while snorkeling. My favorite from this year was someone in a Shrek mask and gloves. And I'm putting links to a few videos and photos from the championships in the show notes because you sort of have to see it to get the full effect. 
Bogs aren't that deep, and they're very muddy, filled as they are with moss and other dead plant materials. So you've got people in all kinds of bright costumes with snorkels on their faces, swimming through these murky waters in a remote Welsh countryside with beautiful mountains in the background and a big crowd cheering them on. And I should say that the event also includes the bog triathlon. According to Wales Online, this year they had one triathlon that was an 8-mile run, 12-mile mountain bike ride, and 60-yard bog swim, as well as a version about half the length. And while the triathlon is more physically demanding, the costumed bog snorkeling championships are still competitive. Competitors must keep their faces in the water at all times and are competing against the clock as they swim 55 meters in the bog, with only the doggy paddle allowed, although they do get to wear flippers to help propel themselves. The world record belongs to Neil Rudder for 1 minute and 18 seconds. This year, Rudder didn't quite break his personal record, but seems to have been victorious among other competitors nonetheless, with a final time of 1 minute and 20 seconds. Average times can veer closer to 3 minutes, with some new competitors this year reporting that it was much harder than they anticipated. And while typically annual, this was the first bog snorkeling championships held since 2019 due to the pandemic, and by all accounts, it was a roaring success. So, maybe something to add to your bucket list. Well, that is going to be it from me for today. This show was produced by Ride Home Media. I'm Jackson Bird, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow.